We're back for season six of my podcast. I'm all about putting the human factor back into business by helping organisations become places where people are happy, well and able to perform at their best. And that's what my guests shed light on with their expertise and experience. As those who know me will be very familiar with, my mantra is simple, get people right, get business right. And that means we'll be covering a whole range of topics that impact on employee experience engagement and mental well-being and many of you will know that I hate tick boxes so we'll be kicking those out getting beneath the surface of shiny new initiatives stripping back layers of complexity and going back to the fundamentals of good business that's the people this series runs alongside the launch of leadership labs and manager labs that I'm excited to be facilitating with the fabulous Gemma Ellison of Heart Leadership these are interactive and dynamic communities that turn typical L&D on its head if you you are a manager or leader and want an opportunity to problem solve, challenge the status quo, experiment and evaluate all within a small supportive group, get in touch. More information and contact details are in the podcast notes. I'm your host, Lisa, psychologist, psychotherapist and founder of It's Time for Change. Thank you for joining me on Beyond the Water Cooler. I'm delighted to be joined by Olivia Sharp, who's a partner in HR practice at Eaton Bridge Partners. So welcome, Olivia. Morning. And I'm super happy that you're here because you've just come back off holiday and you've just been getting children to new schools and you're up to, I was going to say, I'm just signaling up to my neck, but it's actually probably up to your eyebrows in terms of technology not quite working and probably a whole load of other things to be doing. So thank you very much for joining me this morning. Really welcome. It's a nice light relief from all of them. <laughs> um, so I'm, um, I invited you to join me today because um, I want to discuss the role of CPOs, Chief People Officers. Um, after reading your report that you had published in the Independent in May earlier this year, and I saw it on LinkedIn and I read it and I was like, wow, this is really interesting because the whole role of HR, I think, has been, I've heard lots of debate about it over previous years. Mm-hmm. And this is the first report that I read that I'd actually done some really good kind of research and got some really good findings in terms of saying this is the state of where we're at right now. This is what's happening. Um, I like as a psychologist, I like research. I like to look at actually what is the state of play and and how do we then think about the the future of work? So for Mm -hmm. me, I was like, got to have a conversation with you. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today, looking at what your report is about, what some of your findings were. Um, and I guess what that means for organisations in terms of HR and what their their role looks like as we move forward. Before we dive into all that, tell us more about what your role is. So I'm a partner in the HR practice at Eaton Bridge. We are a um, leadership business in essence, and um, we provide leadership leadership solutions to organisations globally of all shapes and sizes, albeit we're a UK based business. Um, and so I sit in one part of that, the executive search part of that business, finding great talent for organisations within the HR function, so chief people officers and their direct reports, typically. Um, but I sit alongside specialists in all of the other functional roles, so anything that would sit alongside the board table, um, sorry, around the board table, um, both executive and non-executive appointments. Um, we are also a very large provider of interim management solutions, albeit I specialise in permanent appointments. And we also have a third consulting arm to providing support for business transformation in in our clients too. So I specialise in HR appointments. I've got an HR background, so I was an HR director before I moved across into search. Um, And I've been working in this role with Eaton Bridge now for coming up to seven years. Mm. And I know from when I spoke to you, a few months ago about what you do and and how you work and so on you love your role and and you love what you're getting stuck into all this um into all the HR stuff and and actually having the opportunity to do research and actually to delve into what is most meaningful in that world at the moment and I and I know you know we talked about this specific report but then you were like I want to do this next I want to do that next and and actually that's I that really lines with me in terms of actually where are we going so before we look specifically at some of those findings the report talks about chief people officer what do we actually mean by that 
term because there's I always like to unpick terminology because there are so many terms used and I'm not altogether sure that they're always used in the same way to mean the same thing so it'd be really helpful to unpick that a little bit yeah you're right actually um and my personal view is in the HR function more than any other the role job titles are really interchangeable and also sometimes meaningless Mm. there's a real difference for example between US terminology and UK typical terminology Um, and we made a a conscious decision when we started this piece of work to call it the CPO pathways the chief people officer pathways and to encompass all other job titles in that group Mm. because um, in the market those roles could be a group HR director could be a chief a chief HR officer could be known as an HR director, people director, chief people officer. And those roles sometimes sit in an executive team, um, executive committee. Sometimes they sit in the next layer down. Sometimes they report to a, a chief finance officer. But more typically now they will report into a, a CEO. So we've called it chief people officer. Um, but we intended it to cover all of those job titles. Um And the other thing that I think is interesting about this report is that you will find in the vast majority of cases, a chief people officer at the top of the HR function in any organisation. Sometimes that position still doesn't exist, Um, but that could be in an 80 person business Mm. or it could be in a 100,000 person multinational. And obviously those roles are very different. We've looked at all reported um, appointments across the UK and Europe um, in that period, but it could cover roles everywhere between the two. So do you think the change in terminology in what HR people in their roles are calling themselves has come about, has been accelerated because people are very keen to communicate that they are not about traditional HR. So I know some people, and I'm only basing that on the people I've spoken to who say, I'm not that, I don't want to be that traditional HR person who deals with sort of just policies and so on. I want to be doing the really exciting stuff around employee engagement and experience and all that, much more people side, hands-on side. So they try to find something that communicates what it is that they actually do, which is where you said earlier, we have so many different titles now and it's trying some of them are some of them more helpful than others <laughs> is, is that coming about do you think because people are just desperate to communicate what they are and to try and be a bit, bit more relevant I definitely think that's at play um I mean you have to it's a controversial subject really mm. I think you also have to look at the history of the function um there are many organizations who will have started either with just a payroll department or a personnel department. And there are still some organizations that still have personnel. Um, we've moved through personnel into human resources. It's always a joke about human remains. Mm-hmm. Now then into people um, and more recently people and culture actually, or people, culture and engagement, people, culture and change. So the function itself has been through a huge amount of change and COVID and when we started this set of reports in 2021, you know, the world was looking at the HR function in a really different way. I think throughout the report, we talk about HR still, and here at Eaton Bridge Partners, we still have an HR function, but more and more organisations are calling it the, the people and culture function or the people function. And I think that's indicative of the desire to show it is a more strategic lever for the organization and to be very clear what the HR function is here to deliver. Mm -hmm. So not just about the basics, which are all important, the engine room of HR, getting people paid, making sure letters happen, Um, but actually the transformational nature of HR and the possibilities that it offers. But, you know, governance structures, um, organizational norms, all of those things play out in organisations and we do often get asked here, what should we call this job? Um, we've just um, appointed a chief people officer into Eaton Bridge Partners um, and in its previous um, guise, that role was an HR director. So we too are going through that change. What does this role say about us? How do we benchmark it against other roles in our leadership team? What's the message we want to send to our people about how important this agenda is? So all of that is at play. 
I also they get asked that question quite a lot by candidates when I'm working with them um, about roles and does it matter when they're looking for a future role what their current job title is and having worked in-house I know that job titles can be hugely emotive not only do they place you in the hierarchy internally but they also represent you externally when you're looking for roles or talking at events or networking um, and I give everybody the same advice which is ultimately it sort of doesn't matter and when you're looking for your next role you can convert your slightly odd internal job title into something that's market appropriate because ultimately they're all interchangeable um, I'm never sure if we in HR are a bit more worried about job titles than the rest of the world. And an old line manager of mine once said to me, um, after all, Olivia, it's not like we all get up in the morning, read our job title and our job description and decide what we're going to do that day. And it stayed with me through my whole career because I think, yeah, that, that's true, actually. It sort of doesn't matter. We, we know what we're doing um, broadly, so the job title shouldn't really matter, but it, it does to others. I love that. I love that example as well. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write that quote down. <laughs> I'm now wondering if he's going to watch this and he'll know immediately it was him. <laughs> um, so how, why did this report come about? Um, so a few reasons. Um, because I have an HR background, I'm hugely passionate about the function, the role of the chief people officer, the agenda it sets in organisations, its importance. And of course, we are talking to organisations all the time about how they could evolve this role to drive their ultimate business priorities. Um, but actually, in reality, the first report that we delivered was um, looking at the path through the finance function for the CFO. Um, and one of my colleagues, Stephen Tarrant, um, did the first piece of research looking at trends through the, the, the finance function. And I read that piece of research and I just found it absolutely fascinating coming from my background, thinking about talent and having conversations with candidates about which decision you need to go through door A or door B now. I've got two job offers. Which one's going to get me to where I want to go? And to have some real tangible data rather than, frankly, just a lot of opinion um, uh, and advice, um, I thought was really fascinating. And so we embarked upon doing the first Chief People Officer Pathways as well. And now Stephen and I are running those reports annually and we're looking at other others of our kind of functional specialisms to look at those those trajectories too. You know, things like chief technology officer, um, CEOs, they're all in the limelight and part of the work that we do. And it's so great to be known for that in terms of um, being a go-to place then to, to get up-to-date research and look at what findings are sort of relevant to that particular industry. Yeah, it's landed really well. Um, we're just about to embark on writing the third of the CPO Pathways reports. I'm sort of bracing myself for the end of this year. Um, it's always my Christmas present to myself to, to start writing. Um, and what we found over the last two years is how interested organisations and individuals are in the data. HR has a terrible representation, uh, reputation for not being very data oriented. I don't think that's true at all. Um, and I think our insight and other reports like it have enabled people to look and analyse and make in more informed decisions than perhaps they were able to make before. And we're sort of no longer in the era where you, you didn't have a job for life, people weren't sorting out, people aren't sorting out your, your career for you now. And the, the candidates who get on and achieve are the ones who are driving their own careers. So I think being able to provide that kind of analysis and data and the first year we looked at the UK and then we've been comparing with Europe and um, people are having much more international careers as well. And I think that's been quite helpful um, as well as, you know, we've had some difficult, challenging conversations off the back of the data, things like gender, age, how the two interplay. Um, I certainly have had more than a handful of conversations with people who've said right I've read that report Olivia and it it sounds like if I'm going to get to where I want to go I need your help to find a new role and I need to do it now um so it's a heavy weight to carry that people are making career decisions off the back but um I do think it's it's just really interesting information and you know as a, a female professional um I'm going to say in my early 40s um 
you know, these things are are true for me too. You know, we we've all got big decisions to make, and um, and so it was fascinating to to look at the data and be able to provide some um, a jumping off point for people to think about their careers. And I think that for me is so important because it's about enabling people to make informed decisions. And I think so many decisions in business for ourselves, for our teams, for the greater good of the the company are not really thought through and based, as you said, based on anything. It's like, well, that's how we've always done it. Or that's what I've always thought, or um, it just looks like it'd be a good fit. And you don't actually really check that out and I think that's I'm a, I'm a real fan of being able to stop and to say actually do we have evidence to say this works and if not what does work the best so having that and 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 it will for me the challenging conversations that come off the back of it are really important to have because we don't have the challenging conversations nothing changes <laughs> so it's really great to have a vehicle that people can you know refer to and say actually this is the thing that we are all going to look at and discuss and have that as, a, as almost like a discussion document about what you know to reflect on their own practice yeah I agree and probably the the one element of the research that we have more have had that's, I'm, I'm hesitating to know if that's true the, the element of the report the sec- section of the data that for me has been most interesting to talk to people about has been the proportion of internal versus external appointments we clearly help organisations find successes for that number one position and sometimes hiring into a number two role specifically to make sure there's a good pipeline of talent internally. Um, But we also meet people who have been sitting and waiting Mm. for a while um, or where their chief people officer has stepped out of the organisation and then their role, that, that role that they thought they were going to have has gone to an external candidate. And to be able to really critically look at what is going on how many roles do truly go external and how many do go internal has been really helpful for people I think to to think am I going to uh, sit and wait and feel reasonably comfortable that the right thing will happen here and I will end up getting my goal um or am I going to take charge of my own career and recognize that I'm probably more likely to achieve that if I go and move externally um, so that's been a really fascinating conversation to have with people and I, I've enjoyed watching people taking charge of the situation themselves um, rather than waiting because the proportion is quite, quite different. So what we found is that um, external appointments are much more common into that chief people officer seat um, uh, and there were real differences both between gender um, and um, geography. So you are definitely much more likely to be appointed externally, generally, um, but you are nearly twice as likely to achieve an internal appointment as a man if you are based in Europe than you are if you're based in the UK. So the number of internal appointments to the Chief People Officer role for male candidates is less than 15% of all of those appointments that are made, um, which is huge. So you're already looking at maybe 40% of the appointments that go internally. And then only 15% of those go to male candidates, which while the balance of the function is predominantly female, at that senior level, I'm not sure it's as skewed as it is across the whole function. And um, so there's, you know, very, very different. Whereas in Europe, um, you're twice as likely than that to achieve a, a CPO appointment internally if you're a male candidate than you are in the UK. So 30% of those internal appointments go to men. That's quite a staggering difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, was that, really different. Was that surprising for you, or did you already have a sort of gut feeling from your experience of knowing, you know, getting a feel for the trends in your industry? Was did that kind of back up what you thought might be happening, or was that a surprise to you too? I, the the stark difference between um, UK and Europe, and for the purposes of the report, we've separated the two. Mm. Um, it still doesn't feel right not to talk about UK as part of Europe, <laughs> um, but for the purposes of the report, we separated the UK from Europe. And it was surprising that it was double and um, mm. were twice as likely. Um, and I, I, I talked a lot with people about why that might be, um, because clearly um, publicly listed businesses across Europe will have reasonably similar requirements in terms of diversity at board level, et cetera. 
Um, so yes, the differential between the two geographies for me were, it was a surprise. Um, when you take the overall though, um, and looking at um, male, female appointments, just generally across both geographies, um, the fact that it sits about 25% of appointments being male, um, whether that's internal or external, um, didn't necessarily surprise me. Um, because of course we support in a lot of those appointments um, and it probably feels about representative. So what we, what we know from all of the data is that of all appointments, 25% of them went to men, uh, to male candidates, um, according to publicly available data. Um, and that's consistent with the total number of chief people officer appointments um, positions that are held by women, which is 76% of the population. So it doesn't appear like there's much change happening across that broad mm. geography. But the difference, the obvious difference between trends in the UK and trends in Europe were a surprise, actually. Um, so I I'm not sure why that might be. Um, particularly in publicly listed businesses where you would assume the governance requirements of a diverse board would be similar on the stock exchange, but possibly could be because of differences in the um, types of roles that were appointed last year across Europe compared to the, the UK. We saw some differences in sector um, trends, for example, um, where some sectors might be just have a tendency for larger or smaller businesses things like um biotech businesses tend to be smaller so you might get different trends there mm. um but the extent of it yes was a was a surprise mm. gosh fascinating so what are some of the other key findings then from the report that you think might be relevant to explore here because i mean it's fascinating because what you're talking about actually covers on so many different aspects of employee their whole experience at work their ability to engage um perceptions beliefs everything and which is what you know my whole focus of, of work is about and what this podcast is about so it's really interesting actually just hearing you talk about some of the specifics what other kind of key findings did you um did you come across um there were some really interesting key findings for me um <clears throat> we had the privileged position of being able to compare a lot of the data with the chief finance officer research that we've done and while we talked quite a bit about external versus internal appointments um, and that they um, make up a smaller proportion 40 percent of those overall appointments it's still significantly more common to appoint an internal candidate into the people seat around the exec table than it is into the cfo seat um, so for me that was quite surprising um, and perhaps speaks to the fact that um, organisations value that kind of institutional knowledge more, how stuff gets done around here, what the culture is about in the people role than in the CFO role. Mm. Uh, my personal view is those are leadership positions more and more than technical positions these days. And so I would argue that you need a good dose of that in both seats. Um, and that both roles are equally technical. Um, but of course, I have a bias towards the people function. But that was a surprise um, to me. Um, we also looked at actually what is the most common route through um, quite a complex HR function into the chief people officer role. Um, not a surprise to me at all. The most common route is through what we would call a generalist um, background so a, a, an HR business partner through a head of HR into an HR director and then on to chief people officer but the most those candidates looking at our own anecdotal experience are much more likely along the way to have picked up experiences in specialist roles so they might have done a bit of time in talent or reward or um, culture or engagement along the way but it will be part of their toolkit mm -hmm. rather than their primary skill set um, and we are seeing, though, more specialist experiences come through. And there's some evidence that um, people sitting in the broader talent function where you're thinking about leadership capability, skills for the future, engagement, culture, et cetera, um, is becoming a more common source of candidates moving directly into the chief people officer role. Um, 
we've also seen um, a real increase in the requirement for employee relations experience and industrial relations capability um, in the hiring trends that we've seen here at Eaton Bridge Partners, not just in the chief people officer seat, um, but across the whole function. Um, because of what has been going on in particularly in the UK landscape more recently. Mm. And that's something I mentioned at the beginning, I've been here for seven years and I come from a heavily industrialized background, um, but it's not the most, um, my colleagues would tell you, not necessarily the most glamorous or exciting part of HR to people coming through into the function and building their career. And so there is a, a bit of a dearth of skills um, and capability and experience in the function, but I think that we might see them becoming more important in the short term um, than, uh, than less, my personal view. I think, that's, I think that's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I've had conversations with different people who are in quite senior in the company who are wondering whether they're considering whether to sort of move out of their kind of role altogether or to try and keep going up sort of a career ladder and, and they're working it out. And I've had quite a few conversations with people who talk about their journey so far. And it'll be, well, actually, I'm too generalist or I'm too specialist. Mm -hmm. And There are different ways of thinking about that. Do you have, in terms of your own opinion or, you know, influence, obviously, by your role at Eastern British Partners and probably by the findings, do you have an opinion about if someone's at the beginning of their career and thinking, okay, I want to end up doing something like a CPO role, I should try and start off being quite generalist and then specialize and and is there do you have particular sort of advice around what is most useful for either kind of the place where we are now or actually just for the future of work I mean I do have an opinion but it's he- this is the nub of the issue it's heavily biased by my own personal career experience and that of the people that I see being successful around me um I think that leadership is a skill and and you build it through the experiences that you have in your career and if the direction of travel that you wish to pursue is into a senior leadership position then the skills and experiences the technical skills and experiences that you pick up along the way will of course be additive but there's no perfect recipe to add and mix into the mix with the leadership capability as well and I often um as anyone who knows me will know I often compare what I do with matchmaking um and I try and explain to people that when you're looking for a significant other um you have an idea in your mind what that person might look like what the experiences and skills they might have uh, the background and what they might physically look like might be And you might find the perfect fit to that list of, you know, a thousand things. But along the way, you will meet and date and have horror stories about people that were probably quite close to that description and people who were further away. And so your perfect partner will, in your mind, kind of evolve over time. Mm. And if we think about our partners, and I should say at this point, my husband is is wonderful. Um, (laughs) But but we all make trade-offs along the way and the perfect person is rarely the exact replica of what we thought we might land up with um, when we start out in our career or our life journey Um, and sometimes there are things about them that aren't perfect for us Um, but there's another quality that is just perfect Mm. and so we allow one to be slightly less and Mm. the other to to outshine and I think when it comes to it's a very elaborate (laughs) rubbish anecdotes right I love it analogy but a way of saying you know there's no perfect route there's no perfect career path and if I if I'm hiring three chief people officer roles in the next couple of months the job descriptions might read fairly similarly but what each CEO needs for their business at this time will be different what they as an individual CEO needs from their chief people officer will be different Mm. the journey of that business and its strategic priorities will be different the team that work for that person will be different. And so you can hone and curate your career as much as you like, but your perfect job at the end, you might not be perfect for it, but you might be perfect for something else that you haven't thought of. And um, so 
that's a really long-winded way of saying I, I think it's important to give credence to it and plan your career in a way that you're going to enjoy it and you're going to keep learning and it's going to give you the energy and the interest that you are looking for but I think if you're too prescriptive and too sure that you know the right route you might miss amazing opportunities along the way that is such a good answer I just love everything because it really I hate off the shelf kind of standard fixes for things and I'm very much about uh getting to understand unique situations with every individual every company and so on and so what you've just explained in terms of when people say well how should we do this or what does that look like or it's like actually it depends on your set of circumstances it depends on what it is exactly everything to do with where you're at at the moment where you want to be going and Mm -hmm whether that's about an individual coming into a team or how, how the team's functioning now, where they want to go in the future. Um, it's always so different. And I, so I love your answer for me. It's like brilliant because when we can get past the notion that we have to tick the boxes of doing a career journey like this or having these particular role titles in order to be able to access that, you know, when we can get beyond that and just, do something that we know we're good at that we really enjoy and we keep moving forward and whatever shape that is new opportunities come up and I, and I think that that is good advice because it almost gives people permission not to try and map out everything that puts a huge amount of pressure on people doesn't it if I've got to figure out everything I want to do and how I want to do it and where I've when. got and yeah and when it's like my goodness just enjoy where you're at now I'm, I talk about this a lot in terms of my own career journey. You know, I I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have predicted I would be where I am today doing what I'm doing five years ago. But mm. I had a real kind of growth mindset in terms of this opportunity has come along. I'll try that. That's not really for me. This one's come along. That's brilliant. And you just, it's that squiggly career idea, isn't it? And and I love that. I think I'm, I'm such a fan of that. I, I, I think so too. I mean, I've had two really significant career shifts both have been fascinating one more successful than other I would say um but when I think about early talent you know people coming into the workplace now they don't want to join a business in job a and then just in a linear way move up through their career they they already know that and and I think that we're still building career paths in some cases there's some brilliant career pathing work that gets done of course I'm really lucky to see it um but we have to remember, those of us who are later on in our careers, that that, that is not how people want to build their careers. Mm. And, and that kind of journey through their experiences will be different. And there's a, a couple of really good examples I can give you. The first is um, related to CVs and, and, um, and career stories. Um, if you go back pre-pandemic, um, people were always really hesitant about putting career breaks on their CVs, even if they were, you know, two or three months between jobs. Mm. Um, But if there was a significant career break to have children, to travel the world, caring responsibilities, fancy going back to university, not only were candidates really hesitant to put that on their CV or explain why, but organisations were a bit suspicious about why people might do it, what was the reason they were out of the market, off the market um, for a, a, a sustained period. Post-COVID, I think we can say we're post-COVID now, I, I can say that it's very few of my clients that even ask questions about why was there a career break on the CV. Most candidates don't really write it on to their CV anymore. And if it is a point of discussion, most organisations are really interested, fascinated to know well, what have people done with their time while they were not working? Um, were they, you know, do I make the decision through my own lens that they must be very community minded because they've been volunteering? Um, am I going to make a bias based decision that maybe there's some childcare or caring responsibilities? And, and the curiosity that comes through because of how people are navigating their careers in a slightly different way as a result of the jolt of the employment market we had, I think has really moved us forward and enabled organisations to feel a bit better about the fact that people do have squiggly careers or just Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. non-linear careers. I think the other example I would give is 
it's brilliant to be um, espousing the benefits of, of a, 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 an unusual or atypical career path and squiggly careers. But the going back to the data of the report, what I think it's been helpful for us to say to people is, look, if you're in a director of talent role and your end goal is to be chief people officer, you've got a few routes here. So your path through the function could be, you could sit and you know that you're likely to be considered for the role internally. You could try and find a role externally and move straight from your talent director role into a chief people officer role in another, in another organization. We know from the data and from what we see, that's rare, but it's becoming more common. So you could do that. You could put all of your eggs in that basket, or you could decide to move across into another talent director role in another organization, but be very clear with that organization that your direction of travel is X. And so both parties know what you're trying to achieve. So what I think is useful for people about the data is to be able to think, how am I going to use this knowledge to plan my next step without using it in a restrictive way mm -hmm. and being much more informed about why I might talk to someone like me who's calling them out of the blue to talk about an opportunity or my, why I might decide it's not the right thing because it's just replacing one role for another in a different context. But is there the opportunity to use that as a, a jumping off point for where I'm trying to get to. And that's what I think is fascinating, what we occasionally forget. Um, I know I've done it in my career, certainly when I moved here. Mm -hmm. um, the advice I give to candidates is when you're thinking about a job opportunity, don't just think about what this opportunity is giving you, but what's the one after? What's yeah. how? Did, where's it taking you to? Um, and that sometimes is helpful in the world of all of these opportunities to decide which one's right for you. Um, so that's helpful to me. And I think, and I think it's really good advice, really good advice, because um, I was having a conversation with someone recently uh, outside of work who said that their um, daughter or son who's in their 20s is not in in work at the moment, although they've had an most amazing um, educational experience and uh, got a first class honours degree and, and so on, but they're waiting for the perfect job to come up. And it's like, we could be waiting for quite a long time for the perfect job. And it's actually just thinking about what is something that I will enjoy or um, that I'm quite good at and just see that as a stepping stone to what I think at the moment might be my perfect job. That idea, as you said earlier, will probably change. Um, but actually, if we just wait for, if, if we're just expecting the perfect thing to come along straight away, that's quite unlikely, isn't it? And actually just having that notion of stepping stones, getting closer to, your idea of what you want to be doing and just knowing that everything you're doing on the way as long as you're going about it with intent is going to be adding to your skill set and your experience your knowledge and so on yeah I, I mean my personal view is I would agree but um there is there's a million and one ways to do everything <laughs> there and you can navigate your career in your in your own way I think the important thing is being comfortable about the decisions that you make. And for some people using data like we've got here or in the CFO pathways is, is, is helpful. Um, but it can only be one reference point as well. I think yes. listening around you, taking advice from mentor, mentors, sponsors, colleagues, doing your due, due diligence on a, an opportunity, mm. all of that, you can then pull in to enable you to make a, the right decision for yeah. you. I always smile when people are, are sort of waiting for the perfect job. So I'll go back to my dating um, yeah. analogy because um, I'm sure most I'm sure most people have got similar experiences to mine. And sometimes you think you found the perfect person, and then maybe they're you know yeah. intellating conversation or you know that everyone's no yeah. one's perfect. No yeah. one's perfect. So are there other key findings that would be worth exploring here a little bit? Uh, yes, um, I think the other, there's probably two others. Um, the first is around sector experience. And um, we are a sector agnostic, such a horrible term, but a sector agnostic business. Um, so we work across really all sectors with just a bit of a limitation. We don't do very much in, in public sector for obvious reasons. Mm. Um, and we believe deeply in... Um, a kind of diversity of approach and diversity um, within our hiring um, processes and trying to enable organizations to see the breadth of capabilities and experiences out there in the market. Otherwise, what's the point of using a search firm? Um, and 
we all here work and come from hugely different backgrounds, lots of different sector experience within our own organisation. And actually one of the easiest ways for organisation to bring diversity, particularly of thought, so not from a protected mm. characteristic perspective, into an organisation is to hire from another sector. And you might choose to de-risk that by going for an adjacent sector, but to hire from a different sector. Um, and a couple of years ago, that was becoming more common. Um, so the importance of sector experience was becoming less, um, was lessening. Um, this year, though, what we saw is actually sector experience appears to be becoming more important in hiring decisions than it has been previously with ownership models. So, for example, whether people have got private equity experience for a private equity opportunity, also having a key contributory influence. And um, I don't think it necessarily follows that it's absolutely critical. It comes back to this kind of you know tapestry of what does a candidate bring with them to an opportunity and what are the critical requirements for an organization and where are the trade-offs and of course the role of the cpo is so should be in my view just intertwined with that of the ceo and the cfo that i wonder whether some of what we're seeing in the cpo population is being affected by what's happening in the cfo population um, and that's as a result of the work that Stephen has done in our CFO pathways research. Um, it seems that in the CFO population, sector experience is becoming less important. Um, and so as you would typically have your CEO in place, then your CFO and then your CPO, it could be, and this is a hypothesis, that if you've got a, a, a CFO without sector experience, mm. you might therefore tend more to find a chief people officer or prefer to have someone with sector experience around that kind of three-point table. And mm. um, so I suspect that could be what's driving it. Similarly, if you've got a first-time CEO and a first-time CFO, you probably want a CPO who's who's been there before, mm. um, and the reverse being true. So that was quite interesting. Um, and the last piece is probably around the trend in overall volumes. So over time, there appear to be more chief people officer positions, more appointments happening every year with a a spike in 2021, I suspect that's in reaction to the significant and ongoing people challenges that were happening across most sectors at that point. And it just has slightly dropped into the end of 2022. So the 2023 data will tell us whether this is a, a long-term trend um, or that kind of normalizes a bit. My suspicion though is that we, you know, judging on how busy we have been, I think it's unlikely that we'll see a significant drop in levels of, of appointments um, into this role because organisations get to a particular size and then need um, somebody leading that people function. And do you think also that, um, I mean, certainly for me in, in my role, uh, the, the result of the pandemic in terms of the impact on companies suddenly realising that maybe they need to prioritise their employees a little bit more in terms of thinking about them as people um, rather than just parts of a, a process. So there was there seemed to be a greater shift with some companies to actually how do we look after people? How do we make sure that they are being careful, that they're able to have a successful experience, enjoy working here, are able to perform well? That was, for me, that's what I experienced with a number of companies I was working with. So there's big emphasis on that I'm wondering if you think and again this might be your personal opinion whether that trend in terms of um, greater emphasis on the employees and their own well-being their ability to perform well is that going to continue or is that a bit of a reaction to the pandemic and now we kind of go back to business as usual and there's less emphasis there's less need for people leading people and that side of business yeah uh, that's a really good question. I think there are some really different schools of thought out there about the importance and the strategic criticality of a people function. Mm. My personal view is that what we have seen so far or what we saw earlier on mm. um, was more of a knee-jerk reaction to what was happening in the world and the function really stepped up in most cases and showed organizations how critical 
having a strong people function was and seeing things and representing things through the eyes of the colleagues were was important um and that still is um i think there's probably a couple of extra elements to it now though um one being because we saw brilliant examples of organizational care and businesses leading the way in um you know relief efforts in, in different parts of the world where there are where there are particular problems mm. um but there's also the realities of if we just come back down to a micro level, look at the UK, cost of living crisis, wages, inflation, mm. and the industrial landscape, um, people's outgoings, the tension on um, what people are actually being asked to do day in, day out in the context of that pressure. Um, this morning I was listening to a report about the increase in shoplifting and the effect it's having on shop workers. Yeah. So so there is some real practical um problems at hand that can be um unpicked and solutions found by the people function mm. um and they're no longer it's no longer seen as a as a tactical problem solving function but let's be looking forward about what might happen but there's also um and for me this is the really exciting bit for hr yes there's all of those problems and challenges and questions that we've never been asked before but there's also the rise in the esg agenda mm. what is the investor landscape what um is the organization doing to talk about its esg activities in the external market as well as internally and that for me fundamentally sits at the feet of the people officer um and I think converting that role from being just purely internal and thinking about making people happy and engaged and feeling well and optimizing performance, all of which are important mm. and converting that role into, and why is that something that is marketable and investable and sustainable? And how do I talk about that externally? That's not really something that the people function that's not true. I was going to say hasn't really been asked to do before, but it's certainly not necessarily always a skill set that the function has been fostering. And so for me, that's what's really exciting about the role of the chief people officer and how it's evolving over time. I'm com I'm completely with you on that. So I um, the reason this podcast is all about around people, around employee experience, engagement, that ability to um, connect well with the organisation but also to enable the organization to do what it needs to do. And I've talked with uh, that covers so many different topics, so many different strands. And I deliberately a couple of years ago moved away from talking so much around mental health and well-being because I think it's all it's very narrow and people put a very specific lens just to look at a very tiny area of, a, of the whole people agenda. A few months ago, I talked with Nicola Weir of Deloitte about ESG on this podcast and we've I've, I've talked about so many different aspects of practice, which is about how do we connect the people agenda with the business side of doing things, how we operate as a business. And for me, it's always I always talk about this, about the, just that joining the, the dots in terms of you can't just have the people person sitting over here doing this stuff and someone else is doing the kind of the proper business side of it over here. So actually it has got to be so intertwined that every aspect of business impacts on people, but also every aspect of the, what the people are doing impacts on everything else. Yeah. So intertwined. So I'm really pleased you brought that up. Well, it's, I think you and I are sort of violently in agreement, actually. We've done huge amounts here at Eaton Bridge on our inclusion conversation and diversity and inclusion. Um, and I've been here seven years and for the last six really I've been driving a lot of activity externally to the conversation around mental health and well-being mm -hmm. and taking us on that journey from well, why is it important to talk about it um but always through the lens of this isn't about and they, they have their place and they're very important I am a mental health first aider but not just about the sticky plaster stuff mm -hmm. but how and why this is important we ran an event two or three probably four years ago now and this and the it was really well received because the, the debating topic, if you like, was what's the relationship between 
mental well-being at an individual and organizational level what's the relationship between that and organizational performance so making it into a much more strategic conversation of an a lever that you could pull as opposed to what you know lots of these things but as opposed to the conversation which some organizations are still having which is that one in four people will suffer from mental health mm. um, condition at any one time so we should probably make sure that there's safeguards around them if they have a problem and that's brilliant and we should uh, but there's becoming over time a realization that if you create a well sustainable organization then you are much more likely to perform it's exactly the same argument as why you might want diversity of all other types in your organization as well and um, so you're preaching to the converted but yeah. for me you know talking about organizational performance and our function has such a huge opportunity to do that. Mm. Not only are we influencing and holding relationships at an individual level with people doing business roles, but also we have that ability to um, uh, see how you can construct and curate a culture that encourages and rewards and drives high performance as well. Yes. So what, so as thinking about that what is the advice then as we look forward so if you think about you know your research reflects where the um hr where the cpo role is at the moment have you projected into the future or what what advice would you um give for people thinking about um developing that role as we move forward and one of the things we haven't looked at yet and is on my agenda for this year is this quantitative data is very helpful um, because it enables people to make informed decisions about their careers. And if you're hiring a chief people officer, you can kind of assess whether the candidate that you're appointing is following similar trends in the market. Um, but what it doesn't do yet is look at what the skills and experiences are that are actually valuable when you're in that seat. Mm. And so over the next few months, I'm planning to talk to a number of CEOs and CHROs about their experiences in those roles, working with people in those roles, and trying to give more qualitative data around where the function is heading and the opportunities that are, are, that are sitting waiting for the, the CPO. And so therefore, what skills and capabilities we need to be building through the experiences earlier in people's careers. And so I'm hoping that the two pieces of research will come together neatly to answer the question. Um, for me, there's some, some obvious things that I'm hearing across organizations, you know, um, digitization of um, both consumer and employee experience. How do you make it easier to be an employee here? Um, and uh, if you can get that right, then um, people are much more likely, brilliant people are much more likely to want to come to you and work for you and give you their discretionary effort. And um, how do you um, manage your talent in a way that enables people to go away, get different skills that you can't offer them, and then maybe come back later in their careers? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, you know, a, a hundred other things. Um, but there are it's such an exciting time for the, the chief people officer role, I think. Um, and um, for me, the question is kind of not, not when is that opportunity going to come, but people sitting in those roles have, have got, I think, mainly pushing on an open door to enable CEOs to, to kind of build organisations that are fit for the future. That's exciting. You're gonna have to, once you've done that piece of work, you're going to have to come back and tell us all about your findings from that. That'd be lovely. Thank you. I'll sort of, as I said, I'm bracing myself a little bit, but I just think it'll be so interesting to hear mm. from people's experiences because we still hear plenty of times clients coming to us saying, look, I think I need to hire a chief people officer or an HR director. But and we, I'll always ask them, tell me about somebody brilliant you've worked with in the past. Tell me about your HR business partner. Why were they amazing? What skills did they have? And I'm still a bit horrified by how many people go, I'm not sure I've ever worked with anybody who was brilliant. And there are so many brilliant people. Um, but it, yeah, I think now's the time to be a transformational function. And, um, and we've got some fantastic talents ready to do it. 
So what would be your advice for, and I guess this could be advice for a CEO or it could be advice for um, a CPO or it could be advice for someone in HR who's thinking about um, where they might move to. From listening to this conversation today, what would be your sort of two or three key takeaways that you think it'd be worth them focusing on as we think about this agenda? Really good question. Um, I think for everyone, actually, whether you're a candidate, hiring manager, or organisation, it's, it's probably the same piece of advice. At the start of a job search or a, or a candidate search, to be really clear about what are the critical things you need this person to have done before. And that without that, they can't possibly be successful here. And that shouldn't be a hugely long list. Um, and for a candidate, what are the absolutely critical things you need this job to have? Mm. And, and then what are the nice to haves from an experience perspective? And then to be thinking about what are the gaps that you have in your leadership team? from a style perspective. So how is this, what could you go out and find or who could you go out and find that would be additive to your organization because they're bringing some difference. Um, And typically that's, I think the recipe for success in finding the right person for your organization. So they bring all of the things that you really need them to bring. Mm. They're not an identikit of everyone else around the table. Yeah. I guess that's that diversity of thought and experience of everything else. Yeah. yeah. Because then everyone's going to have enough stretch for yeah. the relationship to be um, successful and dynamic, but not so much stretch because you've not traded off the critical skills that you actually need and um, that the relationship and the, and the fit doesn't work. Good advice. Olivia, that was so helpful. I loved hearing the kind of the key points that came out of that report and actually just how to apply you know you can read the report but actually hearing you talk about it and really relating that to people's experience now I think is is hugely helpful um before I let you go and before I kind of make a date to get you back once you've done your next report um Seb Randall who is another guest on my podcast um, has provided a blind question for you okay topic (laughs) so you don't have to look so worried if you could leave a message or a piece of wisdom for future generations what would it be um I will go back to my A-level teacher and share some words of wisdom that she gave me when I was 17. She said, when you have a big decision to make, um, once you make it, you'll never know if the other one would have been better. And once you're able to, once you become comfortable with that, decision-making becomes easier. And I think about that a lot, even now, a number of years later, about five. (laughs) Um, Because once you make a decision, you you have to switch your mindset to making that decision the one you're going to make work and letting whatever it was go. Because you will never know if you'd gone through the other door, if it would have been better. And I'm not sure it necessarily applies to the conversation we've had today, but it's been such a fundamental part of my career. Um, and I, I think I probably share with people quite a lot um, that it is hugely important from a leadership perspective to me to think, OK, I'm going to make a decision and then I've got to let I've got to let it go. Very good advice. Very wise A-level teacher. She was wonderful. She was wonderful. Miss, Mrs Hills. <laughs> Mrs. Hills, hello and well done if you're out there listening. Because <laughs> actually, it's 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 words like that that then stick with you, and you share with other people, and they're just 
they have such a strong message in them. They really can be a guiding principle, can't they, in terms of how you think about things. It's, it's so influential. Yeah. And, you know, typically we work with people, both organisations, they might have two candidates to choose from and they've got to yeah. tell their colours to the mask or candidates have got to decide between two or three opportunities. And I think I give the same advice to both. Once you've made your decision, you have to you have to go for it and make it work Best and, don't, and don't look back because you'll never you'll yeah. never make the decision work if you're still thinking about the other job or the other candidate. Well, I made an exceedingly good decision inviting you on today, Olivia, to join That's me. Really kind. Thank, you Thank you so much. Great conversation. Um, just great to hear both about the report, but also your personal opinion based on your own experience um really valued that so thank you very very much we will put references to um the reports and perhaps some of the other um reports that you've talked about and so on in the show notes so people can um, check those out but um thank you so much for your time and you're now free to go and actually get on top of all your other work <laughs> having been away so i'm really grateful olivia thank you thank you very much for having me it's um not been as uh, dreadful as I thought it was going to be. You've made it easy on me. Thank you very much. Pleasure. I hope you enjoyed the conversation today. I invite you to think about one thing that you will take away to think about or do differently. I'd be really grateful if you can give me a thumbs up on Apple or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And for an extra brand point, leave me a short review. I'm really keen to help drive real change for better practice in the world of people at work and spreading the message will help that. I'd love you to also join the club to stay in the loop and be the first to hear about exciting things that I'm developing, including free downloadable resources. Please do reach out to me directly to discuss the topics covered on this podcast or perhaps other challenges around people at work. And if we're not already acquainted on LinkedIn, please connect. All the links you need are in the show notes. Until next time, bye for now.